Howdy folks, J. Scott Phillips here, and welcome back to these here parts. Today we are bound for Retribution, with a look at Charles Portis's 1968 Western novel, True Grit. And this is a contribution of mine to Michael K. Vaughn's June on the Range, which is a booktube event that he created last year, and this is the second year running now, uh, celebrating Western fiction, which uh, unfortunately in the literary world, as far as... Uh, favorite reading genres go, has been kind of a dying breed for the last few decades here. And uh, so June on the Range is trying to breathe some life back into it. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did the Rootin' Tootin' June on the Range booktube tag, which was a booktube tag created by Steve Donahue, kind of delving into our own background with Westerns. And one of the questions in there was, what was your favorite western movie and for me that has always been true grit or at least since it came out in uh, 1969 i believe uh starring john wayne uh there's a newer version by the coen brothers uh starring jeff bridges which is very good but to me that original john wayne movie uh just has it hands down um i mentioned in that uh rootin tootin booktube tag that i had never read the book and thought that I should probably correct that this year with June on the Range, and I've done that, and boy howdy, am I glad I did. Now, the movies, if anyone has read the movies, or read the movies, seen the movies, and read the book, uh, you will know that the movies are very true to the book, right down to the dialogue and the types of language that the book is written in. It has kind of a, a, a strange... Uh, uh, manner of speaking, and uh, we'll chat about that a little bit, but uh, in reading the book, uh, there is kind of a, a, an understandable reason for that. <clears throat> but before we get into that, uh, let's take a quick look at Charles Portis, the author, and uh, see where he came from and uh, what's up with that guy. Charles Portis was born in 1933 in El Dorado, Union County, Arkansas, and after high school, he served in the Korean War as a Marine, and then after the, the war, he came back home and uh, got his degree in journalism from the University of Arkansas. One of his early jobs was to edit and redact uh, the stories that were written by lady stringers for publication. And uh, what a stringer is in newspaper parlance is a reporter. And uh, uh, they're called such because they would string words together for stories in an easy way for the general population to read. And Lady Stringers was, uh, uh, they were women that would, uh, I guess, kind of in their spare time as a hobby, would decide to write historic accounts and interesting articles and uh, other kinds of uh, popular reading for the newspapers. But they had a general style of kind of writing flowery language, kind of purple prose, and in order to make it more suitable for general reading, uh, those would often get edited down to uh, be a more of a general style of, of uh, writing. And that was one of Portis's early jobs. And it's one of those lady stringers, actually, that his character, Maddie Ross, in True Grit, is based on. She was a lady stringer, and the story True Grit itself is in that style. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. But Charles Portis worked for the New York Herald from 1960 to 1964 in New York City and for a time overseas. But after that, he returned back to Arkansas again to devote himself strictly to writing fiction full-time. And he came out with his debut novel, Norwood, in 1966. His second novel was True Grit, and it first appeared in three installments serialized in the Saturday Evening Post from the May 18th through June 15th, 1968 issues. And uh, it appeared in that form slightly condensed uh, compared to the text of the uh, actual novel. And uh, the transitions between issues is a little stark uh, compared to the to the novel text, they often would break right in the middle of a paragraph. Now, uh, the 
I don't know which was written first, if the serialization was shortened to uh, get it into the three issues of Saturday Evening Post, or if it was lengthened for the for the later novel. Uh, not much later, it only came out a few months later in that same year, 1968. But uh, uh, Compared to the magazine versions, certain paragraphs are either uh, rewritten noticeably or extended into quite a bit more detail. And uh, so uh, there are also no chapter breaks in the magazine version for some reason. Uh, and it may be that it was written more as a just a continual narrative for the serialization, much like... Uh, the Lady Stringers would have written in for magazines of their day. I wonder if that was it. If not, I'm reading too much into it. But uh, all of that language, all of that uh, purple prose and, and that just that style of the Lady Stringers is written in Maddie Ross's voice and carries over completely through the novel, uh, which is the one that everybody reads now. No one is going to go back and read those old uh, lost uh, uh, Saturday evening post issues, uh, I'm pretty sure. But uh, uh, the the language itself then from the from the book uh, in Maddie Ross's Lady Stringer voice was picked up in the movies. And as a kid watching the John Wayne movie, and actually through the rest of my life, always loved that movie. The language in that uh, often seemed a little uh, quirky to me. It was. Uh, uh, stylized for some reason and it wasn't just one character all the characters spoke in this same voice which having now read the novel just here recently uh it occurs to me that that is that purple prose style it's maddie ross telling the story when she was she's uh much older now the whole story is written as a flashback she's a uh much older woman now uh, writing in the i believe the 1920s of what happened to her when she was a 14-year-old girl in the 1870s. And as a writer now, she is correcting the grammar of all of her writing and characters and all that as she remembers, but she still uses a lot of the slang and uh, uh, lingo of, of that portion of the country and of those characters, but then just correcting uh, the grammar and that, I think, is what results in that uh, very interesting and stylized uh, dialogue that uh, you might raise an eyebrow while you're watching the movie. Uh, but uh, it wasn't just a, a quirk of the movie. It's, I think, a carryover from Maddie Ross's journalism style. And she just applies it throughout the book to herself and everyone that uh, she deals with in the story. Uh, so uh, that's one of the things that makes the book really fun to read is just her storytelling because she often addresses characters. She's always correcting everybody. She's Even though she's 14 years old in the book, a lot of her chiding may come from her later years, but you read it and believe it as a 14-year-old girl who grew up as a, a, a Presbyterian uh, religious a little girl who believed in her scriptures and what's right and what's wrong and she had a very pragmatic approach to life and so she would scold people or correct people uh throughout uh her her the, throughout the story of true grit all the all the ruffians that she's always having to deal with uh, are always she always kind of looks down her nose at everybody until they prove themselves uh and she even, one of the fun things as you're reading the book is that she's even scolding the reader in a lot of cases uh, about what uh, what we should be doing and believing and, and uh, or trust that we do. Uh, so it's a fun, fun read. Even having seen the movie probably a dozen times in my life, if not more, reading the book for the first time was kind of like watching the movie again, but even more so. There are a lot of stories, as you would probably imagine, in the book itself that are touched on or hinted at in the movies, but not really delved into just to keep the plot moving for a, a two-hour movie. But the book is so much richer in a lot of background stories. And a couple of things. One in the movie, they touch on the train robbery that uh, uh, Lucky Ned Pepper and his gang pull off when they when they rob the, the Katie Flyer. Uh, that's just mentioned and kind of glossed over and goes pretty much unnoticed, I think, in the movies. Uh, 
Uh, but in the book, we get a whole chapter about that train robbery, and it's pretty exciting and leads to other things and fills in some gaps. Uh, otherwise, uh, you may not uh, uh, be aware of from having seen the movies. And then another thing in the book that is only hinted at in the movies, I think the Coen brothers touches on it a little bit more, but that is uh, Rooster Cogburn's relationship with his best friend through life, uh, Marshall Potter. And we get a lot more background into that in the book and why Potter was so important to Rooster Cogburn and, in fact, developed him into the character that he becomes uh, by the time of the book. Uh, uh, <laughs> I want to say John Wayne. Rooster Cogburn and uh, Potter uh, met each other in, during the Civil War when they were writing with Quantrill. And uh, so that is a huge influence, just their background with Quantrill. But then they had a separation after the war for uh, not a falling out or anything, but just they went their separate ways and ran into each other many years later when, uh, I keep wanting to say John Wayne, when Rooster Cogburn was uh, uh, in uh, a lot of trouble with the law and Potter shows up and uh, uh, helps him out of that scrape and then gets him to come back <clears throat> with him to become a federal marshal, and which they then performed as federal marshals together for, for years after that. And there is a friendship and a relationship and a bonding between those two characters in the book that you don't get the feeling of, really, in, in the movies. And it's an important background, I think, for Rooster Cogburn. There, I got it right that time. Um, in just the development of his character. And it comes out in the book in a lot of times, either when uh, uh, Rooster and Maddie are writing together and uh, just to pass the time through the long distances that they're always having to travel on the trail of Tom Chaney. Um, and, and that is uh, uh, just telling stories on the trail. And she asks him, she's curious about him, and she's getting to know him better and trust him better and is starting to appreciate how he became the way he is through, through these stories. And uh, there's another scene where uh, they are kind of standing vigil all night over this dugout uh, where they're waiting for Lucky Ned Pepper and his gang to show up, and they don't know when it's going to be, sometime during the night or into the next morning. And so Rooster is telling Maddie these stories to help her stay awake. And uh, so you get a lot more background of the importance of that relationship between Rooster and Potter. And uh, now watching the movie again, after I read the book, I, I watched the movies again. And I do see that they touch on it, but I'm kind of sad that they didn't get more into it in one of those movies, at least, where you really saw uh, that, that kind of uh, galvanizing influence of that friendship on the character of Rooster Cogburn. Now, the story itself of True Grit is fairly typical. It's, uh, it takes a spin on a lot of conventions, and that is where uh, a young person's father is killed, and then they go out seeking vengeance and revenge. they got to track down uh, their father's killer and bring them back to justice or face them down and, and kill them themselves. And both of those feature into this, except that the young person in this case is just a 14-year-old a girl. And uh, the title, True Grit, she's looking for someone with grit, with uh, uh, who is going to take chances and not strictly follow the law, but follow what's right. And that's her driving goal, is she knows what's right and what's wrong, and the law is often right, and she'll go through the proper procedures when it avails uh, her of, of the situation, but she herself is willing to go outside the law or use people who will go outside the law for her uh, when it's right. As long as it's right and just, uh, the law may otherwise get in the way. And it's it's a it's a not a a plot wise much different from many other uh, seeking vengeance western stories, but it's the characters that really hold this story together and keep you reading and compelled and caring about what's going to happen. Uh, it's it's the story of uh, this hired hand, Tom Cheney, 
who killed Matty Ross's father when they were on a business trip in uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas, 70 miles from their home in, in near Dardanelle in uh, Yelp County, Arkansas. And uh, uh, word gets back to Maddie that her father was just shot down in the streets by this guy that she never liked working on, on their farm there. And so now she uh, understands that uh, uh, Tom Cheney has run off out of Arkansas into the Indian Territory where uh, Arkansas law has no jurisdiction. It's under the, under the jurisdiction of the federal marshals. So she hires Rooster Cogburn, who is the toughest, meanest, honoriest, drunkenest, uh, dirtiest marshal she can find because she believes he's the guy who's, who's got the true grit. Uh, but uh, it's been as observed much time before, I think true grit is really referring to Maddie Ross herself. She's the one who's really got the, the true grit. Uh, not that Rooster Cogburn doesn't. But uh, uh, she holds his feet to the fire in many times where things might have gone another direction. And she is the driving force that keeps him on mission and goal. And they become uh, a tight friendship as well as a result. Really compelling story. And another thing that the book does, too, that many Westerns do, Louis L'Amour in particular. But uh, in a lot of cases, I think readers just kind of gloss over it because it doesn't matter so much. But... If you're a history buff and you are a geography buff, uh, all of True Grit takes place in real places and often with real people. There was an historic, an historic, a historic, there was a, a real Rooster Cogburn. Now, the character in the book is kind of an amalgamation of a few different federal marshals, but there was one guy with that name with that nickname, and, and he was a, a federal marshal, that the character is partially based on. And uh, then it also invokes a lot of other historic characters. And all the places they go to, right down to McAllister's, that store that they, that they uh, stop off at, if you're familiar with the movies or have read the book, all real places, all the mountains and all the depictions of the scenes are, are all actual places that uh, they could have gone to back in the day, and you could probably visit them today. The one thing is that in, it towards the end of the book, uh, if you're familiar with the story, there's the famous scene of the snake pit. And uh, that is depicted in the story as being in the, uh, what is it, the, the, stair, the Rising Stair Mountains? I forget the name of the, but it, there, the snake pit was actually in some other mountain range uh, a couple hundred miles away or something, but they, she, uh, she, Matty Ross, uh, Charles Porter brought that over, uh, to the rising stair mountains in, uh, in his book. But, uh, there is a great video I found on YouTube while I was trying to do some research for the, for this video, uh, about that trail that they go on. And, uh, I'll leave a link down to it below if you're interested, but that video, uh, takes a kind of an historic, uh, tour of, that trail and uh, puts it in context with the story. It's really kind of fun and interesting. So uh, check out the link down below if you're interested. Now, I can hardly do one of these videos without talking about the artwork that was inspired by the stories or books that we chat about on my channel here. So I'm going to take the next few minutes and we'll look at three different artists uh, for three different iterations of the book. And we're going to start with uh, Stan Golley's illustrations for the Saturday Evening Post. And I think these are really important uh, in a lot of ways because these are the sorts of illustrations that are just lost and forgotten now. Uh, if uh, an illustration appears on a book cover, that can stay around for years, forever. Uh, or if there are, if there a, a certain edition of a book is uh, released, like we'll talk about in our third installment here, uh, where... Uh, a, a special edition is highly illustrated, that book is sold for years and years, and so you can come across them. But when they were printed in the slicks, in the magazines, in those old serialization days, uh, whether they're short stories or serializations, those illustrations are were just tossed out with the, the weekly garbage, unfortunately, back in the day, and uh, are lost and forgotten now. So you are... Uh, probably never going to come across them. So when I get a chance to, I'm going to 
talk about those and show those uh, just to keep them alive in the uh, in the culture and the story of the of the book itself. And there's a lot of great artwork that we're missing if we don't do this from time to time. And this first one is the opening spread of the first installment of the serialization in the May 18th, 1968 issue of the Saturday Evening Post. And Stan Golly here gives us two illustrations, one a sketch and one a, a full a, a painting. We see up in the upper left corner here, Matty Ross. This is the first depiction we've ever had of our heroine here. And she's giving us an appropriate glare, a <laughs> judgmental uh, expression there. And uh, that leads us then into her story and down to the, I think, fantastic illustration uh, depicting the scene that happens at the very beginning of the book, or actually just before the beginning of the book. And it's Tom Chaney gunning down Maddie's father, Frank Ross, in the streets of uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. And I really like the way that this particular illustration is composed. It takes into account the gutter of the two pages there where they meet in the middle and uh, frames off Tom Chaney on the far left there really well. And then there's this big empty street. And then clear over on the far right, we see uh, uh, Frank Ross meeting his end there. The composition, I think, is fantastic in that the vanishing point of the street is right behind... Uh, Frank Ross's uh, head and shoulders there. And so all the lines of the street and the buildings and the lighting and everything all converge to that one point where he's getting shot. And that's what launches the entire story here, this one incident, this one moment. And uh, I love how we get the light coming out of the windows that we don't see, I believe, of the boarding house there where uh, Frank Ross was staying and then leads the eye back to the our villain there, Tom Chaney. And then we get that little pool of light there around the flash coming out of the rifle. And it just has you bouncing back and forth to the pertinent parts of the illustration there. And it tells that story. This is what launches the story of True Grit. It all began at this moment. Then a couple pages later, we get this neat little inset illustration here of Matty Ross confronting Rooster Cogburn. This is their first meeting here. And it's an interesting, it's not a full, fully painted rendering. It's a, somewhere between a painting and a sketch. And uh, I really like how it's not even really completed. You see the important parts here, but if you notice, uh, Rooster's uh, legs and feet are kind of disappearing there into just very rough sketches. Uh, it's an interesting technique there to keep your attention on the confrontational expressions of, of the two characters there. Now, this is our first depiction we ever see of Rooster Cogburn, and you'll notice that he's got uh, a mustache and he's smoking a cigar. Uh, that's probably supposed to be the cigarette that Matty rolls for him. Uh, but uh, if you think of Rooster Cogburn as John Wayne, like I normally do, I don't think of Rooster Cogburn as having a mustache. But in the book, he definitely does, and it's uh, uh, come up uh, in many descriptions of him just because it it is reflective of his unkempt nature and his kind of grisly, dirty uh, uh, grooming standards. But uh, a great little uh, uh, illustration here to uh, take us further on our way. This next one is the one illustration that we get for the second installment. This is from the June 1st. 1968 issue of the Saturday Evening Post, and it shows us the famous scene of Maddie uh, riding across the Arkansas River because she has not been let onto the ferry. Rooster and Labeef have kept her from getting on. They don't want her traveling with them on their search for Tom Chaney. She is not to go with them, but she's determined. She's paid her good money cash to uh, have it her way, and so she is bound and determined, and so she fords the river on her own with her new horse here, little Blackie, and uh, those two together are are quite a duo through the, throughout the book, 
And uh, this shows the beginning of her own true grit, I think. And in the background, we can see the ferry that is crossing the river uh, in the distance there. And uh, just a, a, a great uh, illustration there that really pulls the reader's eye. Not only is that a captivating photo, but just the motion of Maddie and little Blackie uh, themselves lead us right into the text of the story. So it's always fun to uh, uh, have that that guidance of, of the reader's eye on magazine spreads like this. Then the last illustration we get from the Saturday Evening Post is from the third and final installment from the June 15th, 1968 issue. And it's another great illustration of the snake pit at the end of the story. Now, Maddie has just confronted Tom Chaney. Um, she is just her and Chaney alone and she pulls out her father's dragoon pistol, the big old horse pistol that she's been carrying with her through the entire story with the specific intention of using it to kill Tom Cheney with it if the law fails to uh, bring him to justice. And that moment has finally come and she shoots him and the uh, discharge, the, uh, the kickback of the gun she's not prepared for. And so she falls back backwards into the snake pit, tumbles down, and is uh, now trapped. And so we get this great illustration here of the pool of light coming from the surface down to a, a create a spotlight around Maddie in her most dire moment in the entire story here that will lead to percussions, uh, or repercussions rather, uh, for the rest of her life. And uh, uh, it's a great final illustration to this three-part story that uh, we got to see for the first time in the pages of the Saturday Evening Post. A little while after the Saturday Evening Post run of the serialization, still in 1968, Simon & Schuster published the first edition of the full novel, True Grit, and that's the novel that we all know and love today. Uh, the cover is by Paul Davis. I really like the style that Paul Davis used in painting his cover here. It's a nice reflection of the storytelling itself. Uh, it's kind of reminiscent of a primitive American folk art painting, and uh, it was, which was kind of typical in the days that Maddie Ross is telling her story. And you can see that it looks like it's painted on a roughly hewn piece of wood so that you can actually see the grain of the board catching the, the pigments and paints in their crevices and the, just the texture of the wood grain itself. And it also feels like the style that Maddie Ross herself is writing in is kind of stiff but colorful and yet kind of uh, primitive but yet uh, expressive in a lot of ways. And so the style of the painting here of this cover art I think really hits the nail on the head. But if I'm going to nitpick, and I often do with things like this, uh, I really wish that aside from all the thought that uh, went into the style of this, that Paul Davis might have read more of the story itself because we're we're seeing even though we see Maddie Ross there and her stalwart horse Blackie behind her there um, uh, there's a couple of details in here that aren't quite right one is that she's wearing a skirt which is going to be kind of cumbersome with all the horseback riding she does in this story now in the movie uh, with John Wayne uh, Maddie Ross wears these kind of culottes pants that kind of flare out like a dress, but they're split up the middle so she can get a leg around each side of the horse here. But in the book itself, uh, Charles Portis tells us that she wears jeans, so that would be much easier, not depicted here. And then the firearm that she's holding there, that rifle, she does not carry a rifle in the story. She carries her father's Colt Dragoon that uh, her dad carried during the Civil War and helped him survive. That's the gun that she means to kill Tom Cheney with, uh, not this rifle. So there's those two little details. Still worked pretty well and was leveraged even further for the Signet paperback edition that came out a little while later, and uh, just a few months before the John Wayne movie was to premiere. And what they did is they kind of took the idea of the Paul Davis painting on the wood grain, that primitive style, and used a promotional photo from the upcoming movie of Maddie and Little Blackie standing in the same position, basically. 
But uh, what they did is they printed it on a really heavy-duty linen cover stock for the paperback. So the texture of the paper was canvas-like. So just like the Paul Davis illustration being printed on that wooden board, we have the, the photo on the back uh, on a kind of a canvassy a, a textured stock that was also, it, this is really kind of a, a black and white photo that then is hand painted and tinted to look like the same colors and tones from the front cover illustration. So a nice use of that. And it also, I've got, I've got my copy of it right here. This also, this came out in 1969, I believe. Uh, yeah, February 1969. And this cover is so hardy and it, that this has stood up over uh, many readings. I bought this secondhand here recently, but uh, and it's even got uh, the original uh, owner's name, uh, Roy Kennedy, written in the in the front here. But this book has stood up the test of time because the the cover is so hardy and uh, also a nice little uh, 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 piece of nostalgia here of uh, promoting the. Uh, Soon to be a major Paramount motion picture starring John Wayne, Glenn Campbell, and Kim Darby. So that brings us to the third and final illustrator for True Grit that we'll chat about today, and that is Juan Esteban Rodriguez. And uh, these were published in the 2019 special Folio Society edition for True Grit. And uh, what the Folio Society wanted to do was to bring the feeling of the novel's rich cinematic history uh, to their book. And so they commissioned Rodriguez to do these illustrations because he is he's a Spanish artist and he's well known for his highly detailed movie posters and uh, gig posters for uh, concerts and other events. And he always brings a, that cinematic quality to il his illustrations. So for the cover of this edition, he gives us this really nice wraparound illustration where on the front cover, we see a, a nice close-up of Maddie Ross there writing Little Blackie. And then around on the back, uh, we see in, in the background, we see Rooster Cogburn and the Texas Ranger Labeef. And uh, we have this uh, nice kind of golden sunset shot here that I imagine this is probably somewhere near the dugout that they're heading to where they are eventually going to run into uh, lucky Ned Pepper and his gang. Uh, other than that, this might be just a generic scene anywhere along the trail that they're taking to find uh, the evil Tom Chaney. Then we have this neat little pen and ink drawing uh, as a frontispiece at the beginning of the book here that is an iconic scene from the story, uh, one that we also saw Stan Golly illustrate for the second issue of the Saturday Evening Post serialization of Matty Ross uh, riding uh, Little Blackie across the river, fording the river when she could not get on the ferry with Rooster and Labeef and uh, makes a nice little intro sketch uh, for the book that uh, you're about to read. Uh-oh. Sorry about that. My alarm system is telling me that there's a battery dying in a window in the back of the house somewhere, so I'll have to attend to that. And we'll uh, avoid any further beeping during the rest of the video here, I hope. Uh, but let's uh, look at uh, the rest of the Rodriguez illustrations for True Grit and get inside the book. And this first illustration is the courtroom scene where Rooster is testifying against Otis Wharton. And it's uh, an important scene. It's fleshed out more in the book than, it, than we get a taste of in the movies. But we start to see the story behind Rooster's relationship and a lifelong friendship with his uh, old pal, Marshall Potter. And that is coming out in this uh, testimony here that he's giving. Uh, this is in the uh, courthouse of uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas, which was reigned over for years by the hanging judge he was known as historically. Uh, that was Judge Isaac Parker. Uh, he shows up in a lot of Westerns. He was an actual historic uh, personality and, and uh, uh, figure. And as we zoom in on the illustration here, I can see Judge Parker uh, at the bench 
uh, we can tell that Rodriguez has done his homework here because that actually looks like the historic photos of the real Judge Parker. It's right after this scene in the courtroom that Maddie first approaches Rooster to enlist him to uh, uh, get on the trail of her father's killer, Tom Chaney. And then shortly after that, she meets the Texas Ranger, LaBeef, who is already on the trail of Tom Chaney, but for a different murder in Texas. And so she is, she doesn't want to have anything to do with LaBeef because she wants Tom Chaney to pay for her father's murder and not some senator down in, in Texas. But uh, uh, LaBeef has approached Rooster uh, in the meantime and has kind of gotten him to agree to team up together. And so then when Maddie joins that uh, duo, uh, that's when uh, all the uh, infighting begins as they hit the trail, which is what we see in this next uh, illustration by Rodriguez here, uh, double page spread illustration. And I think they're on the road here, the Texas road, on on the way to McAllister's where they're going to do some reconnoitering and uh, get some information and uh, move on with their adventure. We do see hints in this uh, landscape here that the story takes place during the winter, and that's important in the in the story in the book. Uh, it's, uh, Tom Cheney kills Maddie's father in November, and then uh, she is on his trail through December, and that's the setting in the book. From uh, my remembrance of the John Wayne movie, it was all summertime and and. Uh, just sprawling vistas and really epic scenery and all that, which uh, really made for a beautiful film, uh, filmed in the summer, maybe the spring, but uh, uh, much warmer time of the year in the book, because it's set in the colder months with snow on the ground and all that, uh, makes the adventure a lot, uh, uh, no pun intended, grittier in uh, just what all the elements that they have to deal with, aside from just the tracking down of the killer Tom Chaney. Then we have another nice double page spread illustration here. And this time our uh, trio, Maddie, Rooster, and Labeef, have come to the dugout. They were looking for this place for a place to sleep during, uh, during the night, uh, thinking that it was going to be vacant. But they find instead that there are a couple of uh, uh, outlaws, Quincy and Moon, and uh, they may have some information on the whereabouts of Lucky Ned Pepper, which is going to be important in tracking down Tom Chaney. And so uh, the marshal has handcuffed Quincy and Moon together and has set them to the task of cutting up a turkey that Labeef has shot for dinner earlier. And uh, that's a mistake because Quincy now has a knife. And uh, when uh, Moon starts to kind of crack and starts talking too much. Quincy takes that knife and we see here depicting the moment when he chops off uh, Moon's fingers in a in a grisly incident there and then that leads to disaster and uh, propels the story along even further. But a uh, nice little important scene here that uh, we see illustrated by the by the firelight. The next illustration here takes place shortly afterwards. They found in uh, a little uh, a makeshift corral by the dugout uh, a bunch of horses. So uh, Maddie and Rooster and Labeef now know that lucky Ned Pepper and his gang will be returning shortly uh, to get fresh horses. And then uh, I think this is where they're going to go and rob the Katie Flyer. Or they're coming back just after having robbed the Katie Flyer can't remember. Anyway, they know they're going to be returning soon, so uh, they are holding vigil now uh, in the dark up in the hills overlooking the dugout, waiting for Ned Pepper and his gang to return. And during this time, uh, it's taking all night long as they're sitting up waiting, uh, Rooster starts to tell a lot of his uh, backstory to Maddie. Uh, lots of uh, anecdotes and things about uh, Marshall Potter and their friendship uh, in order to help Maddie stay awake while they're waiting for Ned Pepper and everyone to, to get there. Then later in the story, uh, Maddie, Labeef, and Rooster are still on the trail of Tom Chaney, but not knowing they're getting very close to him at all. Uh, Maddie goes down from their campsite to the creek to get some water and runs into none other than Tom Chaney watering his horse at the same creek. And uh, 
there's a confrontation there that that happens. And we see in the illustration here that uh, Rodriguez got it right. He is showing Maddie with her father's Colt Dragoon that she is about to shoot uh, Tom Chaney with <laughs> in the short rib, break a short rib, and uh, 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 starts to propel us towards the end of the story here. And then finally, Rodriguez gives us his own version of the snake pit scene where Maddie has fallen down into the pit and is uh, lodged in there and surrounded by the bones of previous victims that have also fallen into the pit over the years and uh, that ball of rattlesnakes that are coming to get her that are going to cause her grave injury that will affect her the rest of her life. So those are the illustrations for the Folio Society edition of uh, True Grit. And it comes in this neat little slip case here. I'll just put it back away for the, put on the bookshelf. Now, uh, the, the slip case has this neat hand lettering here with the lettering flourishes is actually uh, the rattlesnake there that has uh, bitten Maddie and uh, caused her so much grief later in life. But uh, a neat little package to put on the bookshelf there, and uh, there you have it, folks. So that's uh, True Grit and some of the illustrations that have graced its pages over the years. Now, there are other True Grit book covers that have been produced in recent years that are not nearly as inspired as what we've looked at here today. But uh, as long as True Grit is out there and... Uh, is available for reading. You, If you haven't done so already, I highly recommend the book, especially if you're a fan of the movies. A lot of times people will not read the book if they've seen the movies because they feel like they know what's coming. In this particular case, that is very true. Both movies are very true to the book. However, the book has a lot more detail and rich stories in it that uh, flesh that out. And there's just something about the writing style of this particular book that was emulated so well in both movies that if you like the movies, you're going to like the book. You're going to love the book, I think. And uh, so if you haven't done so already, uh, get yourself a copy of that book and start reading. It's not very long. It's less than 200 pages. And uh, I'm kind of surprised with myself and ashamed of myself at the same time for having not read it all these years, just reading it now. And I'm very grateful to Michael K. Vaughn uh, for having June on the Range that got me to do so finally. So uh, that's why I think that uh, you should do the same. So thank you, Michael K. Vaughn, for June on the Range. We're getting close to the end of June now, so I probably won't have another June on the Range offering, but looking forward to next year. I've got a bunch of Westerns to talk about, uh, might slip in a few after uh, June on the Range. But uh, in the meantime, I uh, had a lot of fun uh, with this video and doing the research on the illustrations for it and all that. And uh, so happy trails, folks, until we meet again.